Congratulations, Red Bull, on a dominant Constructors' Championship win. But the solo masterclass from Max Verstappen was not the main story today. Welcome back to the Grid Talk podcast. This is episode 332. And if you'd like to see or hear more from us in your social feed, why not give us a follow at Grid Talk UK, everywhere you can find the at symbol. I'm your host today, Tom Horrocks, and I'm joined today by Monkey Seat podcast host, Carl King. Co-host. And, uh, <laughs> and hit the apex <laughs> Taking host. all the glory. And hit the Apex Coast, uh, Jawa Jakub. Good day, everyone. Good day. Lovely, uh, lovely time of day for yourself today as well. So uh, nice to see some natural light in your background. Uh, so uh, just I'm a, standing in my oh, pajamas. Yeah. <laughs> just a word from today's sponsor, which is betonline.ag, which is your number one source for all basketball info, stats, news, and scores. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest player reports from this year's pro basketball playoffs. BetOnline is always your sports information headquarters this season, as they have you covered for all your sports wagering needs. Basketball, MLB, NHL, hockey, right through to UFC and boxing. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info, including live betting options and your favorite casino and card games you can play straight from your home head to betonline.ag today be sure to use the promo code believe b-l-e-a-v to receive your 50 percent welcome bonus on your first deposits bet online where the game starts so i'm going to come to you joe for, to start this one off and uh, a race that's uh, once again for alfa romeo was uh the, the, the first team we're talking about not for the first time this year and i'm sure not for the last but bottas kind of uh being played ping pong a little bit just being bashed around from pillar to post uh debris from his car hitting joe not unlike the mclarens last year when we saw that happen and um first retirement from boss Haas and uh just a, a lonely zero points finish for joe another disappointing day for them very disappointing and i was saying on the qualifying post show yesterday that what they need to do is just stay out of trouble and exist and finish the race, even if it is in outside the points. So for Bottas, obviously that's not happened and he was involved on numerous incidents, you know, not all his fault as well with the collision with Sargent being rammed at the hairpin that ultimately took him out of the race. But yeah, the first lap incident, I'm sure we'll talk more about it with the other uh, drivers involved, but, you know, often you can't go, you know, three wide into the first corner it just doesn't work um and then yeah joe unfortunately was kind of collateral damage in that incident so but he was able to circulate for the rest of the race and you know came home 13th but bottas he'll be disappointed that you know they could have uh kept the car um from retiring without incident but yeah messy race for them at the end and of course the grid talk customary line of they're just waiting for the audi money they're just waiting for the audi money I'm pretty sure that's going to be mentioned every podcast between now and the end of next season. Uh, just towing the company line there. But uh, Williams was a team that we weren't expecting a lot from this weekend, Carl. I think they said themselves that it was going to be probably their worst race of the season. Uh, but with a race with a you know a few retirements, you'd hope that they would you know, potentially get something. But it was, in the end, uh, um, a, a double double failure for them both. Albon collision with Bottas and eventually retiring. Sargent taking a bite out of the Alpha as well. Um a quiet one for Albon, but cost the error from Sargent once again. The team really wants to retain him, but he's making an argument for them replacing him, isn't he? Wow. Uh, yes, uh, there wasn't much. Um, there wasn't much really that happened without, uh, apart from vanishing off the track. Um, Sargent is like Crash Bandicoot at the moment, just spinning everywhere and smashing into everything, um, and not getting any Inga bungos um, along the way. Um, Albon is doing very well. Um, but he he was unlucky this time, sort of had a bit of a collision. It's like, I, th- I think the Williams almost retired him just out trying to get him off the track just because it wasn't worth staying on there. Um, I d- it just felt like quite a quick retirement um, for not a lot of damage. Um, and it probably wasn't. Uh, the sooner Sergeant goes, the better. Um, unfortunately, he's no American hero to the Americans here. So, um, yeah, I think he's got to go. And I'm surprised if he will make um, the quota at this rate, his own his home races or or Las Vegas. Do you know what I mean? I oh, know Miami's his home race officially, isn't it? 
Yeah, I mean that that scathing words there from 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 Carl King, and uh, yeah, I, I I don't completely agree that he's he needs to be replaced, but uh, I, I think there is there is a bit of an imparity in those cars as well, and that Al- Albon's been getting getting the upgrades. But to be fair, Sergeant keeps smashing the cars up, so maybe he thinks if he smashes all the parts off his car, he'll get the upgrades because he haven't got any of the old parts left. But uh, it's certainly not going well. He, all he needs to do is prove that he's got. You know, got something that's worth keeping and they'll keep him but he doesn't seem to be doing that at the moment so not going well um but another team that not doing particularly well and again expected with the Haas team this weekend not expecting to do anything the last two runners on track so they were able to finish the race but even with five retirements they were still nowhere near the points um yeah, I, I'm kind of a bit of a loss as to what, what to ask about Haas, really. I mean, did you think they were ever in the chance to get any points? I mean, if there was another five cars that dropped out of the race, then sure. But yeah, Haas kind of showing um, that the lack of upgrades that they've had through the season, this mantra that they seem to have of not really developing the car through the season, not really working for them, unfortunately. Magnussen, his only highlight or low light, if you'd like, of the race was the fact that he got rammed by Sergio Perez, a carbon copy of what happened to Bottas with Sargent as well. Um, But, you know, like you said, Tom, they both finished the race at least, but they were last of the classified runners and just off the pace. And I think Magnussen was actually a lap down as well, if I'm not, uh, if I'm correct. So yeah, they're not, you know, they're not really showing anything. Um, I think the fact that you had five cars that did retire kind of flattered the result in the end. But, you know, there's there's not really much to expect when, you know, the cars are not equipped with the tools needed to fight further up the field. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, given the, the fact that a lot of people were still on the lead lap there, that, I was very surprised about that. There was, uh, I was expecting a huge disparity between, uh, I was expecting, like, say, the top five being the only ones on the lead lap. But uh, I guess it shows how close everyone else is and probably how much Max Verstappen probably wasn't pushing as well. But I'm sure we'll we'll get on to that a little bit later on, much later on. Um, but we're going to talk now about the AlphaTauri team, Carl. And Lawson and Sonoda both ran into points at various times. It's the first time we've had a clean weekend for Sonoda against Lawson. So, you know, I was a bit sceptical as to whether Lawson was the real deal. But now against Yuki, he, he certainly does look that way. Way. What's your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Lawson is actually quite a good driver, and um, I'm gutted he's he's not replacing Yuki next year. Not that Yuki's been bad. I just think Lawson is better. Um, I, this is Yuki's home race. He'll be very disappointed with coming behind his teammate. He'll be very disappointed with coming in twelfth. They were dancing in and out of the points. But I think the Alpines got the better of them in the end, um, and and the Astons and um, Mercs. But like, I just think that Lawson is a yeah. It was very clean. Um, Snowder kept out of trouble. We didn't have any sweary Snowder moments, and I didn't even hear anything from Lawson. So I, I'm intrigued as to how their race was really run um, in from a strategic point of view, um, and as to how Lawson jumped. Yuki, because at one point Yuki was above Lawson, but again, we didn't see it, so it's hard to see. Yeah, it was um, very much a, a late push from uh, from Lawson with Snowder behind him. They had very similar race strategies, to be fair. They had they they they. I think I think Lawson had a slight tire offset, but um, but that may have been what undercut him ahead. Of, but like you say, we didn't really see any of it, so it's difficult to to comment really. But uh, Aston Martin, we did see a fair amount from uh, not. A huge amount from Lance Stroll with a uh, with another with another uh, uh, a bad weekend, Jared, and uh, a, a rear wing failure. It seems the uh, as we saw when he pulled into the pits, it was uh, it was looking very loose. And um, you know, Stroll, I thought he did okay up to up to eleventh by the end of lap one with all the chaos. But but you know, Alonso fairly uncompetitive in the race as well. Bad strategy, dropping back, and they really are doing their best to finish fifth in the constructors this year, aren't they? <laughs> um, I, I wonder if that was a tongue-in-cheek comment, uh, Tom. Oh, yeah, sorry, fifth in the constructors, yeah, because they're currently fourth. Um, 
Yeah, and we're finally seeing after Singapore as well with the comments Alonso made on the radio about the car being undrivable, kind of the first signs of cracks between that relationship because, you know, right through the first half of the year, there was a honeymoon period and Alonso talking about how this is the best team ever that he's driven for and whatnot. And everyone knows how, you know, toxic a character Alonso can be when things are not going his way. And remember back to this race in 2015 or 2016 when he made the comment about GP2 engines uh, when he was driving for McLaren with the Honda power. So, you know, the rail, it can quickly fall off the rails. And the fact that, you know, McLaren had another good result this weekend, no points on one side of the garage for Aston Martin and Alonso, you know, dragging that car to P8. He had some good battles, but battles that, you know, he shouldn't really be having in a car that's supposedly quicker than the Alpines as well. And uh, the fact that, you know, he was stuck behind Esteban Ocon for quite some time as well. Uh, the opposite of, you know, a couple of years ago, was telling Esteban to defend like a lion for him, but this time Alcon's defending like a lion for himself and Alpine. So, and yeah, fighting against the Mercedes as well. Alonso had no chance, but um, it's going to be interesting. I think, you know, seeing how many races are left and the sprint races that are coming up too, I have a feeling that Aston Martin are going to lose that fourth and, like you say, trying hard to get that fifth. And with Stroll, no real comment. I think we touched on it in the after the qualifying show that, yeah, you know, he's not really showing much at the moment. And, yeah, today was a, a car failure that put him out of it. But, you know, I'm sure if he stayed on track, he might have run into some kind of incident like we saw with other drivers. It's a it's a curious case of Lance Stroll, isn't it? Because he's he always seemed to be a decent Formula One driver with just lots of opportunities to prove that he could be better. But he now seems to be going backwards, if anything, which is a, a real shame. And and uh, it, I guess it kind of shows how uh, how far removed the Sebastian Vettel was that we were uh, that we were you know expecting to see against Lance Stroll, given that Lance Stroll compared fairly well against. Uh, Sebastian Vettel, whereas now against Alonso, he seems to be in a different ballpark altogether. Um, but moving on to the uh, the other A team um, that we care about, Alpine. Um, what looked to be a pretty uncompetitive weekend. Gasly started the weekend propping up the timings and crashing in uh, in practice as well, and and Ocon had a collision on lap one as well, which which meant he had to box for a new front wing. But in the end, a double points finish for them. Are they going to be happy with that, Carl? Uh, it's not an A team we really care about. Let's just clarify that. <laughs> um, but it is a team that's there. Um, yeah, Nick, they, they, I, yeah, I think they would have liked eighth and ninth, um, to be honest, but ninth and tenth is dealable with. Um, I think Ocon did show some amazing fights, especially with Alonso. I'm, I think he would be gutted to have Alonso ahead of him in the end. Um, and Pierre Gesley did come up the fields quite slowly and got there. Um, I think he started further back, trying to remember. Um, but yeah, I, like they're, they're, they're again, they're a team that's possibly in flux, um, and they've had some good races recently. And they're a team that just need to um, need to ride out this season and try and concentrate on next season with new management and new everything. But it it, it is. You can tell it's affecting the team. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And um, but a, a team that that they looked absolutely dead, sir, for second in the constructors championship not that long ago, Jared. And uh, and Ferrari seems to be catching them at a rate of knots. But an eventful day for Hamilton. A bit of damage, bit, bits flying off the car. It seemed as well. Two great battles with his teammate. Uh, as well, George Russell and and taking time off each other. A team order, which seemed to sacrifice George Russell a little bit, uh, leaving him defenceless. Did Mark miss a trick or was uh, was science always coming through there? And in the end, was it just about protecting Lewis? I think, um, yeah, at the end, it was a case of they were damned if they did, damned if they didn't. They kind of put themselves in that position with the one-stop strategy for George that didn't really work out and, you know, it was inevitable that signs was going to pass. I was glad that, you know, despite Russell saying, um, wait till the last lap to invert the positions and then use the tactic that signs did in Singapore to give the car behind DRS, that uh, Mercedes got Hamilton ahead earlier than that because I think 
if they had left it another two laps or whatever, it was at that point that, you know, they risked losing both positions to the Ferrari. So the fact that, you know, yeah, they did sacrifice Russell in the end, you know, he was on the effectively the wrong strategy or not the most optimal strategy at the time. So, you know, there was no point in trying to rescue a position there. And also Singapore and Suzuka, two different tracks. I mean, it's harder to pass at Singapore. So that would have worked there as it did for Sainz and Lando in that situation. It wasn't going to work here at Suzuka, but scrappy race for Hamilton to get to fifth. Um, He was involved with Perez on the first lap, as we saw going off and getting a bit of damage. Um, And then, looked at by the stewards too with uh, Russell, his teammate at the spoon curve and Russell didn't seem too happy about that, but you know, Rubin's racing and, you know, both of them showing that they are feisty to race each other and it's quite entertaining and it'll be entertaining when the car's in a position to actually fight for wins again. So looking forward to that. But what was telling as well was Hamilton's comments in the pen after the race, um, trying to assert, kind of his lead driver position if you have in the team saying you know he's the one who scored the points today and you know he's the one sitting second in the championship as well or sorry third I should say forgot Perez is still in second now, um for now for now yeah um that's that's going to be talked about a bit later I'm sure but you know Hamilton you know is having a better season of course this year compared to last but you know Russell has kind of had the um the bad luck as well. He's had four DNFs and, you know, now he's lost, uh, he's tied on points with Lando, but he's lost that position in the championship too. So, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be an interesting one and um, for Mercedes moving forward, but yeah, you know, very much uh, going to be interesting to watch them when the car improves for next year. Yeah, I think that's a relationship that's going to vastly deteriorate over the next couple of years if Mercedes make that step forward that they they need to make. Uh, as we we've seen, George can be quite uh, quite um, quite aggressive, and Hamilton uh, when he's against teammates, if he's uh, if he's not the number one driver, he will wrestle his way into that position. Um, but uh, we're talking now about Ferrari, and and as I've just said before, gaining points on Mercedes car, and and it looked like potentially. A good weekend, given that they're gaining points on uh, on Mercedes and showing a competitive car. But is this a return of the uh, of the Ferrari we all know and love, where they had an easy fourth and fifth, and then they've managed to turn it into a fourth and sixth? Oh, absolutely! Like this is just Ferrari, Ferrari. Like nothing changes. Um, yeah, that shouldn't that should have been a fourth and fifth, um, and. Carlos should have probably caught up with um, Hamilton there. Um, sorry, Carlos should have um, defended off Hamilton even, um, but it didn't really. I oh know caught up, caught up. Sorry, I'm going to think about it. How would you caught up? Sorry, uh, wake up, come on. <laughs> uh, it's two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. I'm still in my pajamas. Right. Anyway, yeah, uh, Carlos should have caught up with him. Um, there was no, there was no reason Hamilton was slower. Um, he. I think the the teamwork of of you know Mercedes and screwing that up probably screwed up their race, the Ferrari race. Um they should have been third and fourth, to be honest, in that car. Um so the fact they were fourth and sixth is slightly disappointing. They will be disappointed by that. Um and they will be very, very, very nervous about the McLarens now. Um just taking all their points. So I'm curious, do you think then that, that McLaren have got a chance of catching Ferrari, he says, like, hopefully? <laughs> hopefully. Uh, yeah, it'd be nice, wouldn't it? It would be really nice. I don't think mathematically it'll work. That Ferrari, although Ferrari, because Ferrari, um, they actually have a reasonably good car that is not pissing everywhere and, and breaking into parts. Um, the only thing that they do have is Charles Leclerc. So, you know. Yeah, no, fair, fair point. But um, but we'll move on to to McLaren now. And uh, two of us on this call right now are wearing McLaren merchandise. Um, and uh, I'm wearing two parts of McLaren merchandise just to bring it up to a nice round three. But both drivers had a shot of the lead in turn one, Jared. And uh, and Oscar benefited from the uh, from the undercar and partial benefit from the safety car. Norris, though, he did show good pace and good uh, good time management as well to come through to be a, a, a comfortable and dominant second place. 33 points, a huge haul of points for them. 
Um, how impressed are you today? And, and are they going to catch Aston Martin? Uh, super impressed, Tom. Uh, very impressed. Their best result of the season, of course, with both cars on the podium for the first time since the 1-2 finish in Monza uh, going back in 21. And, you know, hard not to show my delight for Oscar Piastri's maiden podium in F1. And I think he's the first rookie driver to get on the podium since our uh, beloved Lance Stroll as well. Um back in 2018, I think it was, in the Williams there. So, you know, it's been coming for Oscar and, you know, I was nervous at one point there with, um, you know, Russell being on a different strategy, but also Charles Leclerc kind of looked quick on the medium tyres in that second stint as well. So, but luckily, you know, for Oscar, they, uh, Ferrari fell back and the Russell strategy fell apart. Um, there was a bit of a inter-team moment as well when Lando wanted to get past and, um, you know, they kind of sorted that quickly, but it was like, okay, phew, they're not going to crash into each other crash into each other, but Lando was getting a bit agitated on the radio. Um, you mentioned the virtual safety car, which did kind of benefit uh, Oscar early on, but unfortunately then didn't later with, you know, the tyre offset and everyone else being on fresher tyres. But at the end of the day, they were the second quickest car behind Verstappen and, you know, it was their podium to lose and you know they executed a wonderful race and you know going back and looking at the the difficult years of this team you know you're gonna you'll be well aware tom and have suffered through many of those dark days for the team um that yeah things are starting to look up and especially considering where where they were at the start of the year too i mean getting knocked out in q1 and five pit stops for lando in bahrain as well before retirement this is looking good so you know with with the chance of them finishing fourth in the championship um you calculated i think 8.2 points per race now heading into the um heading to abu dhabi to overhaul aston martin i think it's really possible and i would love to love to see it because you know the whole team deserves it they've worked really hard and under the new leadership of andrea stella as well you know there seems to be no drama and he's kept a cool head and kept everyone else cool around him yeah i was doing the maths before the race and and it's 11 or 12 ish points swing every race i thought that's that's too much it's it's hard enough to score 11 points in the race despite outscoring aston martin by that many points but uh but now with this huge points haul and and very few points for aston martin that eight points with a couple of sprint races thrown in there as well that seems possible another couple of races like this and uh, we could see it being comfortable but uh I, i'm still not i'm still not convinced i think aston will come back um, and it will at least be a fight going into the last race. But uh, one thing we are not going to be seeing with regards to a fight is the Constructors' Championship, uh, Carl, and with Red Bull closing that out today, a, a double Red Bull retirement would have been a tantling proposition, but uh, leave it to Perish to get both DNFs. Max Peerless at the front, and Aaron Harper uh, from AHGP put it best when he said, genuine question, is Perez drunk? So... Uh, <laughs> Was he? I, I think the team were drunk as well. Like, oh yeah, we're, we're doing nothing. And then we're sending back out. And then, oh, it was so confusing. I could not work out what was going on. Um, like, yeah, uh, Perez was just having a bit of a, another crash bandicoot moment himself and was just um, hitting everything and hitting everyone in sight. And yeah, I, it was a bit strange. And then, he, so he DNF'd, which was a bit of a like, okay, fine. Um, and then he came back out again about 20 plus laps later, even though it said only plus six laps. So go figure. Um, he was six and- laps behind Lance Straw, who retired 20 laps earlier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is that how they were doing the maths? Yeah. I think that was more luck. Yeah. Um, to then not get his penalty. Um, and then it was, it, it just seemed a bit random, the whole thing. Um, and made um, me think. If they could send them back out, why are they not sending cars back out? If they're retiring them, they should be retired. If they can send them back out, they should finish the race, not re-retire them just because they can't be asked to drive it around. Um, or it, it, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, it, like obviously Max dominated that race, not that we saw him much. Um, and typically we saw him at the end when there was other, you know, races, go, uh, battles going on. 
and you sat there looking at Max cross the line, which is getting boring now. Um, but yeah, Perez, I don't know. Perez did not have a good weekend. Perez was very slip slidey. He did look like he was drunk. Um, I don't know what was wrong with him, why he couldn't get his eye in at all into this race. Um, I think the writing's on the wall again with him, but maybe I maybe one bad race doesn't make a make a firing. Well, no, but it's not one bad race now, is it really? My my opinion is on Paris. Your Mexican well hat is is yeah, well and truly going to George at the moment. It's safe. It's still on my Amazon wish list, but I, I I'm thinking I might send it to George. But uh, yeah. yeah, to anyone who's been in a, I've been in a box the last uh, the last six months, myself and George have got uh, opposing bets where I said Perez will. I actually said Perez will never win another race, but we've uh, we trimmed that down to the rest of this season. And if Perez wins a race this season, then uh, I have to host a podcast with a sombrero in my underwear and george has to do the same if perez doesn't so i'm thinking uh, i'm looking very confident with my bet right now um so we, we haven't spoken much about max verstappen but uh but why would we given that we didn't see him after that you know that first quarter incident he pulled out a gap and uh made a pit stop into fresh air no challenges anywhere around him um i did quite like the suggestion that lando norris made where oscar piastri should try and uh emulate at center in turn one in japan with alan prost um so that he could get the win but uh, alas that wasn't to happen but i'm going to come to you guys now to ask about your driver of the day so jared who, who have you got for driver of the day oh i'm gonna be go vanilla and just go with max because it was a faultless drive from him and particularly coming after the difficult weekend in Singapore too. I know he had some choice words after qualifying to anyone who thought um, Red Bull were finished or they were hit by the uh, technical directive the wrong way, etc. But yeah, Max, you know, showing um, why he's been the driver of the season this year. And, you know, when you look at the constructors' points versus um, the points that he's accumulated himself, two thirds of the point, <laughs> two thirds of the team's tally almost. So, you know, 400 points of the 623 that Red Bull have scored. So, yeah, you know, standout performance from him, Honda's home soil, and, you know, showing why he's been the class act this season. Yeah, absolutely. And to you, Carl? Uh, probably Oscar. Um, I I can't give it to Norris because he was given that position um, and the tyre strategy. So uh, actually, Oscar was a better driver. Um, and Max is, Max is just so far ahead. Like, it's a clean drive, but it wasn't a drive of the day. Um, Oscar had some good fights at the beginning um, and sat there and cleanly did what he did and deserves as a rookie to be there. Yeah, no, that's that's a fair shout as well. And uh, I, I look through that. I always like to do uh, just kind of show a little bit of um, show a bit of love to the people that don't get the draw of the day vote. And but looking through the field um, and I can't think of anyone really besides Max or Oscar that that really deserves it. I would say apart from Lando, or you could say Hamilton, but that defense on George, that second uh, that second defense was just a little bit on the uh, on the. Um, on the over the top side for me. So um, I don't, I'm, I think I don't want to say someone like Charlotte Clegg is so quiet. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with Jared and I'm going to say Max Verstappen as well, because he's, he's got the uh, constructors championship and everything like that. So it's um, uh, it seems to be the, uh, yeah, he definitely was the strongest performer on the day. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different now as, as we normally, uh, we've, we've got a bit of time to spare now. So there's a, uh, there's a little feature that myself and, uh, and Carl do on the monkey seat, which uh, I'm not going to say, cause we're not allowed to say it on, uh, on, on this show, but uh, I'm going to say who would be your doofus, non- doofus no, your, of the day, doof- doofus of the day. I suppose we could call it that. Yeah. Is so that, I'm going to, is that, is that allowed? Uh, I'm yeah, I think we'll go with that. Well, doofus. Um, um, yeah. Okay. Dunce of the day. Right. So Jawan, dunce. who was your dunce of the day? <laughs> Oh, you know, so many to choose from, actually. Quite so, Nine unlike... cars got damaged, just to say. <laughs> yeah. Nine cars had damage in this race. Insane. Unlike, yeah, unlike driver of the day. Look, I've got to probably hand it to Checo on this one because, like we've discussed through the whole show, uh, yeah, possibly he was intoxicated through the time. But, like, come on, it's it's becoming embarrassing and, you know, is his P2 in the championship under threat too if he continues to have performances like this? 
you know, you'd have to say probably, but, you know, if I were him, I'd just be looking forward to the end of the season now because unless, you know, he does something drastically horrible to lose his seat, he probably is looking forward to a um, winter break or summer break, whatever season it'll be in Mexico at home to reset and, you know, start next year fresh because, yeah, he's just been mentally you know, the floor has been wiped with him mentally this season and all the stuff that goes on in the press and what Helmut Marco says as well has no doubt really got to him. So, yeah, he'll just need a big reset, I think, unless he loses his seat. Yeah, maybe Liam Lawson in there. Who knows? It's, uh, <laughs> he's available still. So, no, I can't, I can't say that myself. But, Carl, your dunce of the day? Um, well, dummy of the day is the crash dummy Logan Sargent, really. Um, like he just loves going into everything and everyone and just he's just useless. He's a crock of yeah, anyway. Um, so like he just he just needs to go now. And I don't think he is helping himself. And that's his that's the move that he's making, is that he just needs to just stay on track and stay out of trouble. If he ended up last every race. That's what Latifi did a lot of the time. And that's what kept him in the Williams a lot of the time. But it's when um, it's when you start crashing into everything, you you sort of make a name for yourself. And that's the problem. He just needs to stay, um, stay out of the stay out of the crash. Yeah. Yeah. And uh Jared, yeah, you just said it's uh, still to score points as well. So uh mm. yeah, very valid. The um I believe the only uh driver who's been in all season that hasn't scored points. Uh, I think I think that's correct in saying because obviously with DeVries being dropped and uh Ricardo only having a couple of points. Uh I did see a uh a, a great meme. I forget which uh which movie it is from where it had uh Sergeant saying, What, you scored your first points to Lawson and Lawson be like, What? You mean it's meant to be hard? It's uh, <laughs> that's I forget which movie it is. It's like Legally Blonde or something like that. But it's uh, very very funny indeed. Um, so that's it for the uh, for the podcast. I'm just going to give you guys a chance to to plug your your various outlets. So Jawad, hit the Apex Media. Give us a little plug. Yeah, so you can find the podcast on Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon, I believe. Just me talking about uh, doing race reviews and talking about the Australian Supercars Championship. But you can also find my writing on a website called The Raw, which I do live blogs for all the races. And I just wrapped the one up for the Japanese Grand Prix earlier. And there's a link tree that has all the links that um, you can find me on. Beg your pardon, that was a rookie mistake there. Yeah, I and like, like the Monkey Seat podcast, yeah. we have lots of rookie mistakes like that, where Tom forgets to, to, to hit his mic. Actually, no, we don't have mics off, and we all talk over each other, and it's sort of the right mess. But we're the sweary cousin of uh, Grid Talkers, like, as we call ourselves. Um, and we are slightly edgier and slightly uh, more noisy and a lot more shouty. Uh, yeah, Grid Talk After Dark um is the other one as jared put it there um so yeah uh come along we uh we're every week we're on all your usual podcast channels i'm sure tom can actually promote this better than i can probably but that's at monkey seat pod on the socials and uh com is the website and anywhere you can find grid talk you can find monkey seat as well um so if you've enjoyed this podcast we'd love it if you could give us a five star rating and a five uh, and a review on apple podcasts and a rating on spotify or wherever else you get your podcasts that's that really helps us climb the charts uh, and if you're one of those listeners not subscribed to the channel why not do so if you subscribe on youtube then you click the bell and you can see whenever we go live all our race shows do go out live so you can uh, you can comment and chat in the uh, in the chat and we'll do most of our shows we do a post show as well uh where we we answer the questions and have a bit of a general natter with our listeners as well we've got over two thousand subscribers on youtube it would love be great if you could uh share us with some friends and uh and improve that as well um so as i said before we are available on amazon fire spotify google podcasts apple music verbal and pocket cast and we do also run a patreon so if you want to help us continue what we're doing please continue uh, please please uh, think about uh, contributing and uh, donating to us as well so we can continue doing what we're doing everything does go back in the show so we will be back the next race is the uh, is the grand prix in qatar so we will be back as usual to preview that the week before and then uh, doing our normal race shows afterwards so thank you all very much for joining us and we will see you next time
Cool. Right. Okay. So on- onwards to the post show then. I've not had a chance to look uh, necessarily, but I-, I did spot a comment uh, from uh, Jared Bradley. I hope the man in the white shirt is on today. Uh, I'm actually wearing the white shirt under here. So yes, you, because <laughs> yes, uh, it's my Lando Norris t-shirt. So it had-, had to be worn. So, the man um, in the white shirt. Is that your yes. name? Yeah. Well, no, <laughs> yes. so, yeah. <laughs> It was, Have uh, I something, missed something here? No, it was it was something. <laughs> I, it was uh, I I put a comment in the uh, in the live chat myself saying, "Oh, um, I have a question for the handsome man in the white shirt." A few weeks ago, which was what oh, I was right. wearing at the time. So Jared's doing a bit of a a uh, a, a throwback to that. Um, so we got Ken has said uh, here for the Piastri praise. Well, there's lots of Piastri praise. I think uh, we're all very impressed with him. Um, but I personally think he's the future of McLaren I think uh long before Lando or long after Lando's gone Piastri will be there yeah. getting wins for for McLaren I, can't I don't see I think he's I think he's going to jump somewhere better they'll end up in Ferrari or somewhere and then unless McLaren keep on on this trajectory and stay at this trajectory he's going to be which jumping. I have and I have confidence you know with the structure that they've set up now and the personnel that they are getting next year likes of um Rob Marshall Dave Sanchez the new infrastructure that um, they got signed off under Andrea Andrea Seidel, the wind tunnel and everything. Um, yeah, because yeah, that wind tunnel comes possibly. on, doesn't it, soon? Yeah, I think next year. So, you know, they'll be developing out of that because they're still using the Toyota wind tunnel out of Cologne. So, you know, it would be nice to have their own data to correlate. But, yeah, it's also a sign of, you know, when – they announced the other day that Piastri's in till 2026. You know, now he's theoretically locked in with a team longer than Norris is. So, mm-hmm. you know, and a year into the new regulations of 2026 as well. So, you know, I think that is a way of McLaren saying, okay, well, if Lando, you want to get poached by Red Bull or whoever, um, we've got our future in Oscar. So really exciting. Yeah, and I think given he's got a longer co- longer term contract than Norris now means that if that relationship does break down, I can see um, Oscar being the one that they retain because he's got the longer contract because uh, he'll also be mm-hmm. cheaper than Norris as well, I would imagine. But uh, so moving on there, we've got uh, Jared Sergeant agreed. Sergeant needs to go. He's just not up to the pressure of F1. Jimmy the Skip said Sergeant can't be allowed to finish the season. He's not getting the upgrades because uh, they have to stay under the cost cap. At this rate, he'll be driving a cart at the end of the season. <laughs> I think we've already no, we, rebuilding we... their car. Yeah, and, not, and getting penalties and God knows what else. Well, Carl certainly put his boot in on uh, on on Logan earlier. So, Jared, have you got an opinion on Logan, Sergeant? Oh, look, uh, nothing that's new compared to what you guys have already said. I'm not sure if we said during the show that, yeah, basically they got penalised uh, before the race because they had to build a whole new survival cell and chassis and basically a third car, which you're not allowed to do under the regulations for him. And, you know, now he's gone and been that as well. So, I mean, yeah, literal crash magnet. And it's a shame because on one hand, we've got this argument that uh, rookies need to be given time to develop and, you know, find their feet in F1. And then you've got rookies like Piastri or, or Lawson even who, come out and show that they're on the money straight away so so where where do you what do you do is the benchmark being set too high but at the same time it's meant to be the pinnacle of racing so you either sink or you swim yeah no it's all all fair points all fair points uh we've got uh jared thinks you need more coffee car so uh, yeah yeah i'm out uh, Completely. More, more McLaren shit there. Great race from Lando. This is from Jimmy again. Uh, faster, faster than the race, but it annoys me how Lando always complains when he's stuck behind Piastri. I think all the drivers complain, to be honest, when they're behind and We now play a game in our house. And I, my, my, myself and my wife watch the Formula One. We now play a game, which is how long would it be until Lando starts complaining about being behind Pia- Oscar? Like it now, it's so regularly happening. It, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm glad that um, Russell moans more than him because then I don't have then I don't hate um, Norris as much. It's all posturing, guess, isn't it? Sorry, go on, Jared. I guess. Yeah, oh, it's all right. I was going to say, I guess as well. Lando um, hasn't had this problem for a couple of years because he was very much the dominant and leading driver during mm-hmm. the time with Daniel Ricciardo. So the fact that you know that second seat is actually 
being able to compete with the with the other driver in Lando is um it's great for us to watch but you know Lando's um it's going to be a test of his character isn't it so but yeah hopefully like you Carl I don't end up hating Lando more than I hate Russell already <laughs> Well, there's a lot of lack of love for George Russell on this on well, this he's podcast. He's just a complainy little. Yep, yeah. stop there. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the monkey seat now. <laughs> he just goes on and on as much as I do about him. Well, yeah. that's uh, that that certainly dispels the myth of the British bias in the British media. Not that we're British media, to be fair. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> Russell looks like a Woody in Toy Story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's from our uh, producer Aiden. Uh, yeah, he I agree. Acts like that as well. That's the problem. Yeah, right, right, right. I have to say, I don't know if this 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 this, this, toy, isn't this isn't actually an it. insult. This is a compliment. I think um, George, George Russell has got the bone structure in the eyes to make an amazing drag queen. I've, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's not an insult. He's got the height all. as well. He's yeah. Uh, yeah uh, we, I, I think uh, myself, and my wife have talked about this a few times. We said his drag queen name would be Mercedes Benz. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh well get on the phone to RuPaul yeah. and um get him on for the next season yeah. and i'm also glad that this is in the post show not the actual show or i think <laughs> i would probably be cancelled from grid talk if this was on the main show oh, Just hope the, uh, this shows, hope... the problem with me being on it turns into monkey seat <laughs> yeah yeah you're a bad influence on me carl um right so let's have a bit more perez chat then so jimmy the skip says two weeks in a row perez has been playing 10 pin bowling with other cars um yeah, and they uh, they won the championship, so they didn't need Perez to score points. And uh, and somebody, uh, where was it? Uh, somebody, oh, Jared says Perez for driver of the day. <laughs> uh, yes, and um, Jared also said, uh, how much was the Perez decision to retire based on he's not doing great? Let's retire him and win the constructors championship in Japan in front of the Honda friends. Yeah. I think genuine, yeah. I think that did play into it. He was having such a bad race. Every time he went on board with Perez, it looked like he was going to hit someone. There was um, <laughs> multiple times he was, uh, I think, when he's alongside Joe, it looked like he was going to hit him. And and then obviously with Magnussen, we were on board when it happened. And just a, mm-hmm. just a yeah, an absolute temping bowling session there from Perez. Yeah. He, he had a bit of Albin was... syndrome, didn't he? Where he doesn't know the width yeah. of his car. Mm. You know. The old Alvin syndrome. That's that's a niche reference there for long term monkey seat listeners about how <laughs> yeah. Alvin not knowing the width of his car. <laughs> Sorry, Joe, do you want to say something? Uh, I think yeah, he was side by side with Norris as well at one point going into spoon curve. So, and they were talking about Norris potentially having passed him under or getting ahead of him under the virtual safety car or something. But that mm-hmm. could have also turned sour that situation again. So, yeah, better to. Have- retired him and kept him out of the path of anyone else right now we've got a final question here we're going to go to this will be our last question uh which is actually directed at carl it's from jared bradley hey carl about two months back you said you were in dublin for a quiz show was it was it filmed at belvedere college no no i was uh it wasn't a quiz show it was a it was called the amazing race which was it was an american reality tv show um but no, I haven't been. Uh, yeah, that's what I was doing. Lovely, great. Well, there yeah. we go. That's that's a bombshell to finish on. <laughs> I'm just trying to work out what was at Belvedere College. Anyway, I probably know someone or something that was on. Amazing, right? Well, thanks again, everyone, for all your all your comments and your contributions, and thanks again to my panel for coming on today. That's uh, it was a great race and uh, and a very enjoyable one. So I think we'll end it there. We'll see you all next time.